So my name is Jill Dupre, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to tonight's event. Um, it's sponsored by the Silicon Flatiron Center for Law, Technology, and Entrepreneurship, the Atlas Institute, and also Kurtz Fargo LLP. And for those of you who haven't been to one of these events, the idea is storytelling with a point. So we bring together people from a diverse set of backgrounds to learn more about and talk about entrepreneurship through the stories of successful entrepreneurs. Uh, in terms of format, we'll start with Q&A led by the two brads um, until about 7.30. And then from 7.30 to 7.45, we'll have open audience questions. We follow the Silicon Flatiron's rule of starting with a student question and then opening things up. Um, and then there will be a reception following. Will there be a reception following? Anna, will there be a reception following? Yes, <laughs> next door. Of course, there'll be a reception following. Ah, uh, of course. So <laughs> before we get started, I'd like to get a sense of who's here. How many people, is this your first Entrepreneurs Unplugged event? Oh, wonderful. Wow. Uh, anybody from Anschutz? Great. Um, and how about BioFrontiers? Okay. Students? Wow. Faculty? Great. Uh, entrepreneurs. Wonderful. Um, and we have an entre Aspiring entrepreneurs. Aspiring entrepreneurs. There you go. Uh, and we have a, an Entrepreneurs Unplugged tradition of just taking 60 to 90 seconds, turn to somebody who's sitting near you that you don't know, uh, and just quickly introduce yourself. It's foreshadowing for the reception. <laughs> So weird. How's your family? Everything is good. My son is white. Yeah. He's white with a black jacket. Came in from New York to surprise me for skiing this weekend. And then when I told him this was happening, he said, I'm staying another day. I'll awesome. come. Awesome. He's awesome. He's awesome. And you've been to one of these before, I, right? Uh, the first time I came was the time that you introduced Wendy Lee. Yep. And you were the, I don't question it. And it was one of the nicest nights ever for me. And I contacted him because I wanted more of him. And we got to be friends, kind of. Awesome. He and Phil were just magical. And this thing, so turn this off, this thing of, um, Yeah. No. I totally agree. I totally agree. And uh, it's easy for me to make that argument pretty strongly because um, I, I think it's teach me a lot. And did you guys know each other before? Yeah. All right, well, great connection. Yes, I mean, whatever. Seth has been really one of the most important friends I go with in engineering and entrepreneurship. And Sue and I always tell us just before I show up what I hear. So I'm delighted that you guys were Okay. I hate to cut it reviews, off, but, but, but I'm going to. I love working with him. Everyone is going to be here afterwards for the reception, so please continue then. Um, I want to call your attention to a few events that are coming up. These are all listed in the program that you have. Uh, first, there's an IP crash course with Jason Hazelmeyer. It's intellectual property for entrepreneurs. Um, for those of you who don't know Jason, he's a partner at Brian Cave, a member of the Silicon Flatirons board and really an expert on IP. So this should be a great event. It's Wednesday, February 26th. Another great crash course featuring Brad Feld on startup boards is Thursday, March 6th. And a conference, uh, an innovative conference on sci-fi and entrepreneurship, Is Resistance Feudal? That's Friday, March 14th and has a great lineup of speakers including Brad, Brad, Phil Weiser, and William Hurtling, who's the author of Avogadro Corp and AI Apocalypse, among other award-winning books. So uh, 
check that out. It should be fun. That actually came out of an Entrepreneurs Unplugged session from about five years ago. Um, someone had asked Brad during Q&A, what business books are your favorites? And I believe your response was, I don't read any of them, but I read science fiction, which got me thinking that it'd be cool to do something about entrepreneurship and science fiction. So we're actually going to do that March for, 14th. For those of you, how many people here are into science fiction? I, I really encourage this this uh, event. I think it's, it's going to be pretty special. Um, William uh, is... I describe a category of science fiction as near term, so it's stuff that could happen in the next five to ten years. So it feels very real, but it's a little bit out there. He's one of the best contemporary sci-fi writers in that. And then John Undercoffler, who's the founder of a company called Oblong, uh, who is the science and tech advisor for Steven Spielberg uh, for a number of years, uh, including uh, during Minority Report. So all of you that know, think of Minority Report as sort of an iconic movie uh, much of the creation and instantiation of the ideas were John's. So we'll, we'll get some really good things. That's going to be fun. Yeah. Okay. Um, I also gave you a handout of upcoming events in Atlas. Um, I'm the Associate Director of Atlas. Tomorrow we have a speaker series event featuring Jer Thorpe on making data beautifully meaningful. It's the intersection of science, art, and design, and he's going to talk a lot about dis data visualization. So that should be another great event, and it's tomorrow at 4. And then we usually ask if there are any entrepreneurship-related audience announcements quickly. Yeah, Mystery. Hi, my name is Mystery Murphy. I'm the director of the New Venture Challenge, which is CU's cross-campus cross entrepreneurship championships. Uh, coming up on Monday, we're going to have Nicole Glaros from Techstars come and give a talk on how to pitch. That's going to be in this building, so check that out, cunvc.org. And then on April 22nd are the finals for the New Venture Challenge. This is an excellent opportunity to come and see some of the most innovative ideas, business ideas coming out of CU. It's in this room, April 22nd. Go to cunvc.org to get all the information for those events. Okay. Uh, with that, it is my pleasure to introduce Larry Gold, Larry Gold as our featured entrepreneur. And I won't read his full bio because you have it, but I do want to highlight a few key elements. Since 1970, Dr. Gold has been a professor at the University of Colorado at Boulder and served as the chairman of the Molecular, Cellular, and Developmental Biology Department from 1988 to 1992. He's received many citations, including the CU Distinguished Lectureship Award, the National Institutes of Health Merit Award, the Career Development Award, and the Chiron Prize for Biotechnology. Dr. Gold is the founder and chairman of the board and past CEO of Somologic, which is a privately held protein biomarker discovery and clinical diagnostics company right here in Boulder. Somologic's SomaScan Proteomic technology unlocks protein biomarker discovery across multiple applications. It's be being used today both by Somologic and by its many academic and biopharma partners uh, to develop new diagnostic tests, discover new drugs, accelerate their translation to clinical practice, and reveal deeper understandings of basic human biology and disease. Uh, prior to Somologic, Dr. Gold also founded Nexigen, which later became Nexstar Pharmaceuticals, and then merged with Gilead Sciences. Uh, he held many positions at Nexstar, including chairman of the board, executive vice president of R&D, and chief science officer. And he's a member of the Institute for Genome Biology External Advisory Board at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. And I just wanted to pause to say that we've been doing Entrepreneurs Unplugged for going on six years now, probably eight events a year, uh, and we've never used the words molecular, biopharma, proteomic, or even genome. <laughs> uh, so I'm really thrilled to hear about something that's new to me and to see so many new faces in the audience, and I really hope that this is a new trend for the series to have this area incorporated. And with that, I'll turn things over to the man, uh, managing partner at Foundry Group, Brad Feld, and the director of the Entrepreneurship Initiative here at Silicon Flatirons, Brad Bernthal. Uh, join me in welcoming them. Let's start by, um, in some respects, starting at 
where we are today, and then we're gonna wind things back. But in terms of Soma logic, we have some people here who are moving at a pretty fast level of sophistication, including people from Anschutz, BioFrontiers, but we also have some people who don't have background in bio. Um, help people understand the ambition and, and what you're onto with Soma logic. Softball. <clears throat> I love it. Um, so um, thank you for inviting me. I hope you can hear me in the back. I'm a little um, a mumble. I, um, Somalogic was started 14 years ago, and it came from the work we were doing at Nexstar from 1997 to 1999 when our company was bought by Gilead. And after that happened, I bought back what we had been working on so we could keep it going. And so we've had since 1997 until today, which is 17 years of working on this thing that you still don't know what it is. So the thing is really simple. In 1997, at a meeting at um, Nexstar, um, I suggested that the highest value for us as a company would be to measure quantitatively and precisely some number of proteins, some large number of proteins that are flying around in your blood. So before you get all nervous, you know what that means because you've all done something like that. For men above a certain age, you've had your PSA measured. PSA is a protein. It just happens to have the name PSA, but it's a protein. And if it goes up, people worry about your prostate getting bigger, which it is at that age, or having prostate cancer. HCG is another protein. That's a name of another protein that is measured because when a woman is pregnant, like um, our wonderful host, uh, within um, weeks of being pregnant, her HCG level went through the roof. Before that moment, it was low. The pregnancy test measures that protein. That's two proteins, PSA and HCG. That's just the names of the proteins. Human beings have about 20,000 proteins in their bodies, in our bodies, and about 3,400 of them are flying around in your blood, and they are the things that tell one of the two things, uh, nerves is the other, that tell one tissue what another tissue needs or wants. So proteins are a way for communication to happen in your body. There are only 20,000 of them. And we realized that we could measure a large number of them. And we thought, therefore, we would be able to tell a person if they were healthy or not. And if they were not, what it meant to be not healthy more precisely than yes, no, but something about what diseases, cancers or heart disease or something like that. So that was our idea in 1997. That field, measuring proteins, is called proteomics. There's lots of omics. There's metabolomics. There's genomics. There's lipidomics. There's all these omics things. And proteomics has been, in some ways, the most difficult because the technology to do what we said in 1997 didn't exist, so we had to invent it. Um, we invented it on the spot. Uh, we were wrong. Uh, that is, we were right about what we wanted to do, but the basic idea was right, but the technology was harder than we thought. So some $200 million and, and uh, 12 years or 10 years later, we made it all work. So now we are a company, Resomalogic, that has built a platform called Measuring a Whole Bunch of Proteins whose names don't matter any more than you care about PSA or HCG. You don't care about that. It's just number one to 20,000. We measure a lot of them, and nobody else in the world can do that, and we do it simply, cheaply, quickly. And then once you have that, you can imagine doing something that looks like big data, and then I'll be done. Okay, big data, what's that mean? You get a bunch of people that have some disease and a bunch of people who look like them but don't have that disease, and you just measure all the proteins in some dumb way. You don't know anything. You do it in an unbiased, uh, not a hypothesis-driven experiment. You just do it. 
you'd say, give me your blood. You get a blood from you know, a few hundred people, another few hundred, you measure, and you look for the differences between those two groups of people. And we've done uh, about 40 such clinical trials, and every one of them has worked, meaning that in every one of those things we did, we found protein concentrations that were predictive of the health status of the people that were sick versus the controls. This is like a, um, I wouldn't call it a gold mine, but at the beginning of building a real company um, to do diagnostics. And the ultimate goal of Selmologic, since 1997, it has never changed in uh, all those years, um, is to be able to do that inexpensively for everybody on this earth once a year so that instead of being compared to somebody who looks like you but isn't sick, you're compared to yourself last year and the year before. Because if you do that, that's going to make the data stronger. Things change. And we've done a fair no a number of longitudinal things like that. And sure enough, things change, but just like you'd expect. How could they not? That's the way the body knows what's going on, so it makes perfect sense. And so the goal is to sell one of these things for some inexpensive price. I don't know what it'll be, $100, some number, to 5 billion people a year, and to put all the data in the cloud and and some company of Brad Feld's will then analyze it and tell you what's wrong with you and tell you what doctor to go to and what drug to take and blah, blah, blah. So this is personalized medicine in a way that's meaningful. It's not about the DNA, genomics, because that's about risk of disease usually. And so it's about extinct disease. Is this the answer to your question? It's perfect. Oh, thank God. <laughs> first, first five minutes. Okay, next. Take a deep breath, Larry. <laughs> what, what, when you go back to the beginning of the first company that you started, and you've done a number of companies now and been involved in others, um, talk about that early moment and what you were doing at the time when you first thought about the idea of getting involved in a company and, and what that journey looked for you. Because clearly, you know, from a, a, a researcher, a scientist, an academic perspective, you know, you have an incredible, uh, incredible trajectory. But what, what caused you to decide to put a stake in the ground around entrepreneurship? I, I love that. I was underpaid. The fucking University of Colorado underpaid me. <laughs> and, 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 and I had two children who wanted to go to college. And I couldn't figure out how to do it. And, and, and so the first one we did, Synergen, was 100% about a non-idea. It was about money. So I'd like to admit that. And it worked. We made a lot of money. Um, <laughs> that was good. Um, and uh, that was called Synergen. It was, it was the, and so the, the decision was about needing it. It wasn't about, I, I had no idea. But luckily, the company, the, the venture capital firm that funded us was Warburg Pincus, and they were then the biggest early stage venture capital firm in the world. Oh, I want to do something. I don't know what you want me to do. I can put it in my notes. A lot of suggestions here. This is the entrepreneurial spirit here. Uh, is that better? Can you hear me like that? Okay, so thank you. So, uh, so the first one was about money, and I got fired. Uh, and I was one of the founders. I got fired in 1987 by a guy who might be in the audience today. Still, still lives in Boulder. I hated him for firing me. I didn't speak to him for 10 years, and after 10 years, I realized that he was right and I was wrong. And so I found him, and I apologized for me being the asshole, not him. And um, and now we don't see each other very often. We don't exactly go for breakfast, but. He was right and I was wrong because I was this academic guy that wanted to... When, when was the company started? 1981. I got fired in 1987 and I went back to the university more or less full time. I never really left and I became the chair of MCDP. And then, um, and I thought I was done with biotech, uh, except I'd learned all this stuff from Warburg Pincus and the guy, Rod Moorhead, who was my friend actually. and um, And so... Uh, while I was being the chairman, Charlie Butcher, who many of you know who that is, who died, he was my best friend, and uh, he was an older guy, and when I became the chairman, I, um, I realized that tech transfer uh, sucked here, still does, 
Um, and and um, and um, and so I asked Charlie to come help me as the chairman, help me figure out a way to make money for MCDB. And it turned out that the idea that he had or that we had together was to figure out how to do tech transfer right. And that was when Gordon Gee was the president, and so we ran around to all the campuses, and we met with lots of people, and we had this idea. And in the end, um, the champion, Gordon Gee, had a, uh, this is all being recorded, this is great, I hope he sees it. And Gordon Gee invited me to uh, come down to the Regents meeting in Colorado Springs. I had to cancel a day of vacation that my wife and my son Nick and my daughter Emily and I were going to go take. We were going to Santa Fe. And he made me put that off for a day, and we went down to Colorado Springs, and we met the Regents, and that was, boy, that was amazing. And then Gordon Gee came out and shook my hand and said, we're going to get this done, this tech transfer thing done. And then we drove to Santa Fe, and the next morning in the paper, it was announced the next morning that Gordon Gee had accepted the presidency of, uh, of Ohio State. So he shook my hand. He shook my hand and said, we're going to get this done knowing he was going to be gone the next morning. This is called sport lying, okay? This is <laughs> stupid, okay? All he had to do was say, good luck to you. I'll see you in uh, whenever, later in the life cycle. So this idea didn't happen because the champion went to Ohio State. And then this accident happened, which is what you asked about. Yeah. This graduate student. I was, I knew that, I was just checking. <laughs> the, uh, this graduate student, Craig Turk, had done this amazing experiment, and I heard about the experiment for the first time after having talked to Craig about it, this wonderful man, graduate student guy. Um, and he, uh, the Wednesday before Thanksgiving in 1989, showed me the result of this experiment. And it was like unbelievable, and so it was clear we had to go start another company. And I didn't think we were ever going to do that, but he, this thing was amazing. And what happened is that Craig, who was tall, and I was still not so tall, um, that's not funny, um, <laughs> but it is to you. But, but So Craig wrote a line across the whiteboard, and he stood behind me, and he wrote all his ideas on the top part, and I wrote all, all my ideas on the bottom part because he just reached over me and wrote everything. And then that weekend, I went back home for Thanksgiving, and wrote this patent that became the basis of the second company. And this was different. This I knew from the first time that not leaving the university was not serious. You can't build a company and run a lab at the same time. That's just crazy. But we tried to do all of it, all, all four of us really, except one guy. And so I quit. I quit the chairmanship. Um, I gave up tenure and decided that we were going to do this thing called Nexogen that became Nexstar. And for those of you who care about money, uh, that is not, not exactly me, um, it, it was an amazing financial success because we in the end got bought for a third of the stock of Gilead, a company some of you know of. And that's today the biggest biotech company in history, bigger than Genentech and bigger than Amgen. Its market cap is $120 billion. So the next star shareholders got, if they were still in it, got $40 billion in only 10 years. It went from $1.8 billion the day of the merger, $1.65 billion, to 2.4 that afternoon, and now it's 120 in those 14 years or something like that. And so I bought back. I knew I was going to get fired. Uh, now I didn't have a job anymore because I'd given up tenure, so I couldn't go back. I even thought about it, but nobody seemed to think that was a good idea, meeting my old apartment. I uh, didn't think it was a good idea. And so uh, I had to do something. So I sold all my stock instead of waiting till today when it would have been worth $3 billion. Oh, damn. <laughs> so, so. Nick knows that, that my wife sometimes reminds me of that, say, in the mornings, <laughs> but, but never more than once a day. Um, um, and so I sold it all so we could start Somalogic because we'd started this idea in 1997, this idea of measuring a bunch of stuff in blood. And, um, and now I was driven. So Nexstar was serious because it was about a technology that we didn't know where it was going to go. Synergen was about money. Nexstar was serious. but. But Somalogic is actually about doing something. And so I wish I had 
not done the first two with the same mindset. But so my mindset kept changing. So the, the arc of those three companies is very powerful. Sort of to play it back, the first one was about money. The second one was serious, but it wasn't a mission. Soma logic is a mission. You're on a mission. You've been on a mission for 14 years, 17 years. 17 years is a long time. When you think back on those 17 years, are there phases to the mission? Has it been a nice, steady, consistent, upward sloping curve for 17 years? That's a leading question, right? So, so talk about the ups and the downs, and you know, especially some of the downs on this 17-year mission. I think people that have heard me talk before about startup communities and things like that hear about long-term view, 20-year view, having to be in it. You know, it, it's nice when it happens quickly, but that's atypical. I love that. Um, so, um, in 1997, at Next Star in this meeting of the 100 or 200 people that were in the room, I said what is now Soma Logic um, out loud. And at that moment, I knew exactly how to do all of it. I was almost right. That is, of the 20 or 30 things that we had to do, most of them happened just the way we thought. So we thought this was, people always love saying this in, in this world of startups, we thought this was an execution play that the need to invent was zero. How many times have you heard that? Over and over again, it's almost oh, always bullshit. It's always bullshit, and especially if it comes from my mouth. <laughs> but, but because I was convincing to myself, I believed it at the time. I told the first people who invested after Hope and I invested that it was two years to profitability, the rolling two years to profitability. It turns out we are still at least two years from profitability. I no longer care about profitability. Who cares? To growth. I'm interested in growth, not profitability. Anyway, we have a new CEO and he's interested in growth. It's great. So, um, so we got a lot of it right, right away. And then we started to, we ran up against the things where we needed to invent things. And when you need to invent things, you can't do the timing of inventing because you don't know what you're going to do. And so this was research. So, you know, people, we had a discussion over across the street about research versus, uh, say, basic research versus applied research. But it's still research. There's no difference between academic, in my mind, academic science and uh, company science. It's still science. You've got to make it work. You can't, and you can't break any of the laws of thermodynamics. There are only a few, but, but you know, you'd like to break as many as you have to to get it to work. It didn't work. And so I'd say for the first six or seven years during which we plowed through more than $100 million, none of it worked. None of it. And we kept saying to people, it's going to work. And because we believed it, some people believed us, and we got strategic partners, Quest uh, Diagnostics and others, to, to, to play with us because they believed that we wouldn't ultimately fail. We weren't breaking any of the laws of thermodynamics. We were simply struggling to figure out how to do it. And so today, you know, so we started this in 1997, and I can tell you, I'm not selling stock, so I can tell you anything I want, Nobody else can do what we do. No one else can do it. And that won't last forever, but I, I do a lot of reading trying to figure out uh, who will come along and do it. I don't even see another way to do it. So I'm completely nuts about this. So the, the trajectory in the 14 years since we started Somalogic has been a long early success and then a long kind of bad thing, where it didn't work, it was just bad. But, but because we knew it eventually would work, because it was such a good idea for medicine and personalized medicine and healthcare and all that stuff, we didn't quit. And so the 100 people that are still there, of the maybe the 150 that have been there at one time or another, they actually believe in the technology and they're kind of on the same mission I am. Does that answer you? Yep. When you when you think about 
each of the three different companies, um, what was the, let's go through them one at a time, what was the darkest day? <laughs> and and what was the what was the best day? Uh, yeah. Well, let's start with money. The yeah. company done for money. What was the darkest day and what was the best day? Well, it wasn't it wasn't such a good day. The day I got fired by the CEO. I mean, let's just say that you know when you think you're helping and somebody tells you you're a jerk, <laughs> that's not so good. I mean, I don't, so I don't know. I've been fired a fair amount. And I, like, I think being fired is good for you, uh, but at the time I didn't think it was good. It felt dark, and you know, and you feel a little desperate because you're getting paid, and all of a sudden you're not. You know, that's not good. So that was pretty dark. the The science that happened at Synergen was about a drug. In the end, it was about a drug for um, for sepsis. I don't. How many of you know how bad sepsis is in the world? So you all know about cancer. The number of hands that went up was 14 or something like that. Oh, sorry, 15. <laughs> sorry, okay. So seven or 800,000 people in the United States get sepsis every year in the United States, and half of them die in three weeks. What? That's almost as many people as get cancer, and except for the really bad ones like pancreatic and lung cancer, most of those people live for years. So this is a terrible disease, and there are no drugs. There are no drugs. And it's the easiest clinical trial imaginable. You just count who survives three weeks. That's an easy trial if you had a drug. And there have been 20 clinical trials or 30 at this point. And there's one drug that has been approved and it shouldn't have been. And it's never used. So there are no drugs. Holy moly, right? So we had at Synergen a drug and the drug was went through two enormous clinical trials and failed both of them. That is, they didn't meet their endpoints. Um, and, uh, and those were bad days. I, I was gone by then, but you couldn't feel good about that because there are people dying. So that was not good. Um, so, that, uh, that, so there were some upsides. But I, I like to say that, that I learned about some hard stuff that entrepreneurs all have to think about. Uh, it turned out that I was the best person at Synergen at talking to the people who weren't doing so well and helping them leave. So the first 13 or 14 people who got asked to leave Synergen, I did. And then I was the next. <laughs> I was, <laughs> damn, I thought I deserved something for all the hard work I did or something. So that was bad. Next star was just wonderful. Uh, and because the, the science worked. We had a wonderful CEO that Warburg made us hire, it was in this community, Pat Mahaffey, and he was great, and I learned a huge amount from him. And in the end, the Warburg Pincus guys got bored because we, they'd owned it a long time, and they made, they made, because they owned a lot of, of the company, they made a decision that we should sell it. And that was hard. That wasn't fun. But we'd already spent, I don't know, $500 million or something like that. And we didn't have much to show for it. We couldn't say we're halfway there. <laughs> you know, give me another $500 million. So, um, so that was bad. But, but in the end, Warburg, like so many times in their lives, did the right thing for its funds and the investors. And I, and I didn't like it. Um, but, but it turned out to be good for everybody, including Gilead, that used that acquisition to become the company they are today. Uh, so that was, that was, and, and at Soma Logic, there's been nothing bad because, because we always thought the next experiment was gonna work. So there's a, a story that I think helps provide some context about your ability to beat your own path. Um, talk about going to Yale and uh, the unconventional path you took when you were there. So you, you, you guys, you're going to suffer today because these two guys know, I've known these guys a while, and they know some of the most uh, bizarre stories about my life. And I suspect that what's going to happen is they're going to keep asking these things, so be patient, all right? So, um, 
So this is a true story, Brad. Brad. Um, so I, I grew up in Schenectady, New York, uh, which none of you have ever been to. Um, I suspect. I suspect. One guy. <laughs> oh, two, three. Holy moly. Holy Four. Wow. We could go have beers in my car. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, so I, I was a, I was a, a, a successful um, high school kid, and for some reason, I got admitted to Yale. Um, I applied to six places, and three didn't let me in, and three did, and one of them was Yale. So I went. Um, I didn't know anything about Yale when I went. I just knew that they had a glee club and I was going to sing in some singing group or something. And um, and I made the dean's list my freshman year. I will try to make this short. I, I could tell this story for seven hours. Uh, be, and in fact, I'm so glad, Nick, that you're here because there's this confirmation that you're going to hear about in a minute. I can't believe you're here, Nick, to see this. Um, so. Um, so my freshman year, I made the dean's list both semesters. And I went home and worked for the summer. And then I came back. And I realized that even though I had made the dean's list both semesters, that all these kids at Yale were Christian, don't be offended, tall, handsome, boys. They were all boys then. And they all had read books. They'd actually read books. They knew authors and books. And I had never read a book for pleasure in my entire life, not one. I had never read anything that had not been assigned to me, including my freshman year at Yale. So I got back, and um, this is, I guess, entrepreneurial. I understand, Brad, why you did this, I guess. And, um, and I came to my roommates in sophomore year, and I said, I'm not going to classes this year. I actually said this semester. and. Uh, and I didn't. I, then in those days, you didn't have computers like now. And so you signed up for your five classes for both semesters in the summer by letters and whatever, you know, paper. And um, so I had five classes that I was signed up for. And I simply didn't go. I did not go to a single class. I didn't take a single exam. I didn't do a single, uh, whatever you call them, homework, whatever it was called. And. Um, all I did was go to the Yale bookstore and buy books and read them. And I stayed in my room and read books all day. And I'd read three books a day or two or three or sometimes four if they were short. I liked short books. And I caught up, I thought. And at the end of that semester, I had I got grades for never going to class, not doing a single thing. I got two Fs, one D, and two Cs. <laughs> <laughs> There's a, a sequel that you'll hear that Nick saw about George Bush that I'll get to. Because okay. Nick, you're great. Uh, so I'm in love with my son. So, um, so um, I, you know, two Fs, a D, and two C, that's not so bad. So I told my roommates, I'm going to do it again. <laughs> and um, and um, I did. And at the end of the second semester, with five different classes that I could still find my report cards from, I again got two Fs, a D, and two more Cs. So now I had four Fs, two Ds, and four Cs uh, for the two semesters. And I'd read about 300 books. And like a crazy person. And I've never stopped. I mean, I still read like a crazy person. I have one of the few people that still uses an original Kindle all over the world. I, I just cannot read enough. And so. I was ready to go home to my summer job, actually at GE in the summer, just because that's this thing, you know, never mind. Um, and um, I got a phone call from a dean. And he said, Mr. Gold. So you know you don't want that call, Mr. Gold. He didn't say, Larry, how you doing? He didn't say, how, how's your jump shot? He didn't say any of that. He said, you know, Mr. Gold. And, oh, God. So he said, would you come up to see me? So I go up to his office. I'd never been to a dean's office. And sitting in front of him was um, two or two folders. Is this taking too long yet? Keep going. OK. <laughs> and uh, one of them was last year, the dean's list. And one of them was this year, with my four Fs, my two Ds, and four Cs. And he said, what happened? 
And then I told him what I just told you, more or less word for word, because as Nick knows, this is a story I tell anybody who will listen, including you poor guys. And he looked at me and he said, what did you read? So I told him. So we started talking about Nathaniel West. He only wrote four books. You could finish him before he died. That was good. I read all of you know F. Scott Fitzgerald. I read all of Hemingway. I read all, I read a lot because I read hundreds of books. And we talked about books. This Dean guy and me. And uh, and then he he wrote something in my folder, closed the folder, and he said, it "Sounds like you had a terrific sophomore year. See you in September." He, I, so I came back in September and took classes and got whatever grades I got. And, and I don't think I ever made the dean's list again. But, but I, and then at the end of my senior year, I took classes again my senior year, and I graduated. So I, I told uh, Richard uh, Levin, uh, Rick Levin, who is the former president of Yale, this story in his office about four years ago. And... Uh, because he's become a friend, and for those of you who want to come to the Gold Lab Symposium in May, he's going to be one of the speakers, Rick Levin, an economist. And he said, well, how did you graduate? I, and I said, what? what? What do you mean, how did you graduate? It never occurred to me to not graduate. It's time to graduate, I graduate. He said, well, you didn't have enough credit. And I said, what? He said, yeah, you, you can't graduate from Yale with four Fs and two Ds in your sophomore year. You don't have enough credit. And I said, huh? This was, this was five years ago. <laughs> so, so let's agree it was a little late. The statutes of limitation had passed. And I was OK. You know, they're not going to take it away. But, but um, he said, well, um, uh, I'll look it up. And I said, look it up? He said, yeah. He said, we don't throw anything away. So we found the folder that the dean had written in. And on the bottom, he reported to me in an email, it said, leave this boy alone, he's doing fine. <laughs> so think about that. Uh, think about, think of all your kids and yourselves in college. That ain't gonna happen anymore. I mean, this is, this is a strange thing. The sequel to this, the amazing sequel, so I told my kids this story you know, a million times. You know, follow your muse, I guess that's the message. Why don't you follow your muse? Follow your muse, but get all A's and don't give me a heart attack right to your kids. <laughs> <laughs> so so uh, we figured out who the dean was, who was still alive. And last summer, this dean was honored at my 50th reunion. Ah. And we went, and Rick Levin sent the dean who's now in his early 80s, so he was only 10 years older than I at the time, so he was a kid, sent, connected us. And I told uh, this dean that I was going to uh, hug him when I saw him, because he saved my life. And he said, well, I'll hug you back. And so Nick came uh, to this thing at Yale, and we sat at this luncheon, and, and there he was. My dean, my my savior. You know, if if I was going to start a new church, he would be my god. And um, and so we went up, and um, and we hugged and thanked him, and we had a long conversation. It took five minutes, and he was still great. And then Nick, in, he was impatient. My my little boy Nick said, "Look, I've been listening to this story forever." And I just want a one-word answer. Is it true or false? <laughs> he said. And the dean looked at you and said, it's true. And then he told Nick and I, Nick and me, that, um, that he had done this a fair amount as a, as a dean. And he'd only made one mistake in his entire life, and it was George Bush. <laughs> 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 that punchline was worth waiting for, right? <laughs> Especially in Boulder, Colorado. Um, La Larry, that let's shift into a little philosophy here because I think that that it leads well into it. And and Brad and I uh, teach a course, and Phil Weiser teaches a course called uh, Philosophy of Entrepreneurship. Um, we're doing it for the second year, and the course is really an exploration uh, that we're doing to try to think about how to talk about. Uh, entrepreneurship with students uh, and with people that are aspiring 
to be entrepreneurs uh, in a different kind of way, right? You can read all the crap that you read in TechCrunch and, you know, now in popular, you know, The Economist has long sections about it in entrepreneurship now. But it doesn't really ever capture the essence of creation, creation of a company, cre you know, the form formulation of a new idea and then the effort that goes into building on that new idea. And even the story, you know, in your second year at Yale, it would have been much easier to follow a path. You chose a totally different path that had risk, that had uncertainty, that required discipline. You can't sit in your room and read three books a day if you're not disciplined about it. It'd be a lot easier to sleep all day and 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 screw around because you had. This is going to lead to the joke about. No, I, you can tell that joke separately, um, <laughs> if you'd like. Um, somebody asked him about that joke that he didn't want to talk about. Um, but when you think about the, the essence of it, you think about what's driven you over you know, a long arc um, to, to keep inventing, to keep creating, to keep starting anew, even something that takes 17 years to stay after that thing with the discipline that was required. What's the advice you would give to the younger you? That, that you that was a sophomore or, or, or a junior or just graduated from Yale about what you've learned over the last 50 years that that younger you could have known uh, around entrepreneurship, around creation, and invention, and innovation? So, so, so I, think, I think the guy that didn't go to classes and the guy today is actually the same guy. Uh, the, because I didn't think about the risk of not going to classes at all never occurred to me. I knew I was going to read because I needed to learn to read because otherwise I couldn't learn the things I needed to learn to have a life. So I was driven to read more than I was driven to not go to classes. It was just my method was to, f to make time to read. And, and I've always made time for things that my whole life that I thought mattered. And and so the I don't see the I don't see much difference to be honest with you about me then I was I'm more sophisticated I guess in some ways but to me it's all about trying to do the best you can with every little ounce of energy you have about anything and and I don't much care what it is I just care that you do it you know you get one shot as they say you might as well do it and and so i don't i don't i i knew that when i was young i i knew it without knowing it i couldn't have said it if you'd asked me what are you doing i would have said i'm reading and if somebody said well like my roommates did well what about the grades you're gonna get i i'm sure i said Oh well, we'll figure it out or something like that. I wasn't driven by fail. The thought of failure never occurred to me. And in fact, those of you who are mathy guys know that if you had to, let's say you were going to start a company and you had ten things to do, um, and you thought that each of them was ninety percent likely, so you can do the math of what the likelihood that you'll get through 10 things that are each 90% likely. It's 0.9 to the 10th, which is whatever it is, 0 0.07 or whatever the number small is. Small number. It's a smaller number than 90% because you gotta you know, raise 0.9 to the 10th. Entrepreneurs believe deep down in their hearts that 0.9 to the 10th equals answer. one. <laughs> <laughs> Can I can I blog about that tomorrow morning? <laughs> you can blog about anything except that story. You're not going to tell. Uh, but, uh, I'd like to follow up on that. So, so, so knowing that um, that's a fascinating statement that you had that failure just did not enter your mind, whether it was taking the sophomore year to read books or in 1997 deciding this is where Soma Logic is going to go. Um, where has that led you well as an entrepreneur? And where has that been something that you have to surround yourself with someone who's waving their arms saying, we've got real issues here and can 
um, potentially spot where failure needs to be dealt with. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I don't think it's wise if you're an entrepreneur to, to delude yourself. I mean, I don't think that. So you want to surround yourself. You also want to be the person who realizes when things are hard. And I mean, I, I'm 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 a scientist more than I am an entrepreneur. I think. I mean, I hope. And so, so you know, it's really about you know trying not to break the laws of nature. You can't do that. I mean, no matter how much money you have or how smart you are or whatever. So you got, but you do need teams. I mean, the nice part about and the thing that distinguishes entrepreneurial activities from working in a lab with your own hands by yourself is you can get you can do a lot of discovery by yourself because there's so much that isn't known but if you'd go after one of these companies you will always you can get Brad Fell to tell us this you will always underestimate the amount of money you need and you'll underestimate how long it's going to take you because because you're an optimist. I mean, the definition of being an entrepreneur, in part, is that, that you're optimistic that you can make something happen. And so you know that you're thinking best case about everything. And, and so, so you do need good people. But if you're any good at this, you're not delusional, I think. I'm not delusional. I don't think I'm, I'm delusional about some things, but not that. Larry, a number of years ago, you started uh, Gold Symposium. Um, I went last year. My dad, uh, who's a retired endocrinologist, has gone the last couple of years, is uh, absolutely in love with what you're doing with that. Um, talk about the story of how that came to be, why you did that, and what it is. It's actually the almost most fun I've had in years. I mean, I just love this thing. So, So because of the way tech transfer gives money to the inventors. I had a bunch of money in a university account. I think I had $12 million in a university account. That's a lot in a university account. And I didn't have a lab anymore. So I didn't have any place to spend it. And so Betsy Hoffman saw that, and she persuaded me to give half of it to Tom Check for the BioFrontiers thing, which I'm glad I did because I didn't need it. And then I tried to figure out what to do with the, le the rest of the money. And, um, and it took me a few weeks to realize I couldn't steal it. <laughs> <laughs> you tried, though. You thought about I it. Thought about, I thought about it very hard, because <laughs> uh, I would have loved it, uh, to be honest with you. Um, and then um, I realized that I could do this Gold Lab Symposium. So this will be, this May will be the fifth. Um, and there's a website, you can go look at it. It's really, I think, wonderfully fun to do. It's called, the website is www.goldlabcolorado.com. Or if you just type in Gold Lab Symposium, you'll get there. And the website has in it, um, and I'll tell you what it's really meant to be about, has the talks that all these people have given. And so we, we it's all free. You get, any of you can sign up. Now for this, the room ha holds uh, 420 people. And so we let about 475 sign up. First come, first serve. There's 185 as of this morning, because I get these things set up for this May. And, in, and on Friday and Saturday of May, whatever it is, um, um, eight people each day will talk about whatever it is that that year I thought was worth hearing. So it's, it's, it's psychiatrically nice. <laughs> you get to choose. And, and, and I get a lot of suggestions. And each year, it's been mostly good. There have been a couple of talks that I that I didn't like as much as most of them. Um, and it's and we and, and it's about healthcare, sorry. So it's about healthcare. It's about how do you fix healthcare for all of us? And uh, and I start every year with this little half hour or something about what we're gonna do that year. We invite all those speakers 
from the previous years to come back at our expense, to have some continuity. That's why your dad can come for the rest of my life and bring your mom. It's okay, they get to do that. Um, and, and the talks have gotten, there's always hard science, hard but always done in a way that everyone in this room would understand. Because if somebody says something that I think any of you didn't understand, I will yell and ask for help. And people do that. And, and I mean, one of the talks last year was by this world famous guy, Chris Walsh, who talked about the, the crunch and not having antibiotics for all these infectious diseases. And he gave a profoundly scientifically strong talk that everyone in the room understood. That, which takes some talent, so people work at it. We had some stand-up comedians. Uh, this guy, Danny Klein, gave a talk about, his talk was called, um, um, I think it was called Death, the Prequel, or something like that. I mean, he's this nutty guy who wrote um, about um, how one summer he was told, he's old, he's even older than I am, and he was told by his dentist that he needed to have a lot of work done on his teeth. And he wrote about this in this book called Travels with Epicurus that I read and loved. And he looked in the mirror, he thought his teeth looked like shit. And then he realized that instead of spending all that money to have his teeth fixed, he could go to a Greek island and live for the summer. <laughs> and that's what he did. And his teeth still look terrible, but he, <laughs> but he doesn't care because he had this summer and he wrote about this extraordinary summer. He's a wonderful man and he told an incredible set of jokes for 45 minutes, but they were all relevant. So it's a mixed set of things. And we've been promising, I have, that we would get you know, we're kind of building a community, I guess, of sorts. There are, you know, four or 500 people that show up and have lunches for free, and it's all free, it's fun. And uh, the idea was to see if we could do something actionable about healthcare. And this year, this, in this coming May, uh, two of the people who have spoken previously, one is a guy who's an advertising guy named Scott Danielson, and the other is a music teacher from Austin named Robert Duke who had, I think, the best of all of the talks in the four previous years, a talk of a young kid playing the cello. And you saw this kid playing the cello, and you just cried during his talk. I mean, it was so beautiful. So he's a teacher. And the two of them are concocting uh, an, uh, a, a, a teaching moment for the audience where we all learn what we can do to make healthcare better, whatever that means. And they are thinking about it. And I just got an email from them asking if I would mind if they did something crazy and disruptive and that I wouldn't know what they were doing. And I said, go for it. Yeah. Yeah. So we're gonna, it's gonna be science and you know stuff. And this one is called, I think, um, oh yeah, embracing the reptile within. Mm -hmm. Because remember, your brains even though you think you're a smart cookie, you have a reptilian brain that just, when you put your finger on a hot plate, and you go like that, you think that you don't behave that way absent the hot plate in a way that's just stupid and hardwired, you're wrong, okay? You are a hardwired set of creatures in this audience, and, and it'd be good to know that when you're trying to make decisions. This is the book, Thinking Fast and Slow by Daniel Kahneman. I mean, if you don't think that you're hardwired, you should read that book because that book is all about how hardwired we all are. Um, so Larry, about that $6 million, you know, I'm an attorney and uh, outsource, <laughs> offshore accounts might be a, a solution that we could talk about a little bit. Um, I, I wanna go back to that SOMA was about doing something. When you're talking about the Gold Symposium, that's about doing something. Um, first of all, I wanna surface your theory of the bus <laughs> in terms of thinking about what's worth doing. Um, but then talk about, as you look out, in terms of what's next for you, uh, what do you uh, feel like is worth doing? What's the, the next something from your end? Put the bus first. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, those of you who want to do something entrepreneurial have to figure out how to do something that matters. In fact, every morning 
you have to figure that out, right? That's the kind of complicated thing you're just going to work and doing whatever that's not good enough. So scientists are always asking me, what should I work on? You know, graduates, if we just had exactly this conversation across the street. And what I always say is the same thing, which is why he refers to it as the bus story. It's not a story. In the morning, when you're brushing your teeth, you're supposed to look in the mirror. And you're supposed to ask yourself something simple. If I got hit by a bus on the way to work today, would the world I think I care about be one bit different? Good question to ask. If the answer to that question is no, you should not go to work. You should go back to bed. You should go read a book. You should take your dog for a walk. You should play basketball. Whatever you want, it doesn't matter. Because if your death, as you're hit by a bus, doesn't change the arc of what's happening, it doesn't have to be big. It can be anything. It can be your family. I'm, I'm not, a, not a judgmental person. But it has to mean something. And when you're thinking of being an entrepreneur, which many of you in this room are, if the work you want to do doesn't mean anything except that you'll be richer at the end of the day, well, shame on you is what I'd like to say. Shame on you. Shame on me for starting Synergen. I mean, come on, I was younger than, well, that's right, you're younger now. Oops, wait a minute, that doesn't work. So, sorry. Um, but, you know, you have to, it, it, the choice of what you do in your life should be serious. And, uh, and I, that's what I think. Two more, two more questions and then we'll do q and I have, I have uh, uh, one I want to end on, but before we, we get there, I, I, uh, I turned 48 um, uh, a couple months ago and I've been uh, personally on my own journey uh, in a different place in my own arc. Uh, and it comes back to a combination of a series of things, including you know what I spend my time on, what I want to spend my time on, how I spend my time, and what I think matters, not just to the world, but also to me. Um, and you know, you and I have had some conversations about this, pretty pretty deep ones. Um, some would say. Some would say. We would say. That's right. Uh, I, and I know, I, I know that sort of underneath the arc of accomplishment is a, a very deep sense of your own internal meaning. And I'd love to hear you bring that out a little bit to people. In other words, you know, the mission of the company is one thing. The mission of having, or the, the internal goal of having some impact is another. But what is really the underlying engine? You're so wonderful. So you can't, you can't do this. I mean, you did it. And, but, but it's such an invitation to just bullshit all over the place. And, and, I know. And, and uh, I don't want to do that. I have faith you won't. Well, uh, yeah. So when I went, I, I believe that when I went to Yale, at the end of my sophomore year, I now was a reader. So that's a thing that lets you kind of figure out what you're doing. And those of you who don't remember, uh, so I finished my sophomore year at the end of 1961. That was the year of the books. It turns out that William Sloan Coffin was the chaplain of Yale College, an Episcopalian by training, and he was the guy who led college students in the Northeast to go south to do civil rights stuff. And so he was a hero to everyone at Yale that had a brain about what mattered, okay? And my friends who were all kind of weird and not these guys from prep schools, we fell in love with William Sloan Coffin. And so we spent our junior, our sophomore, junior and senior year going south to, you know, pick it and do all that stuff. And we'd go to the law school, which was then, the Yale Law School was the most astonishing place for lectures about all kinds of civil disobedience and and finding yourself, which is what you're asking about. 
And so Yale wasn't about money for me in the end. It was about values. And I didn't get that in high school. I didn't have that growing up. I was just hanging around playing golf. I was going to be a golf pro. Did you know that? Huh? Yeah, I still can hit it far. <laughs> weird. I don't, don't know what to say, but it's so weird. I mean, me? Anyway, uh, so. So Yale was a place of values. I'm going to start calling you Tiger Gold. They, I, I would I would like that a lot actually, um, for not that reason but for the other reason. Anyway, uh, so 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 find, you're asking about where do you find the underlying values that make make yourself okay, and and William Sloan Coffin handed it to those of us who did that if we were ready to listen to him, and we all my friends were all like me. Great. Last question, then let's open it up for Q&A. Um, looking back, any, any big regrets? <laughs> Other than selling the stock the day after the deal? That's not a big regret. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I didn't understand the balance of my personal life and my family. You know, everybody always says that. I mean, I, I work very hard, as I know you do, and Brad does. And, and, and I, I had a hard time with balance in my life. Nick, again, the famous Nick, I once had a long conversation with him about why I was so successful. I was bragging to my son. And I said to Nick, you know, every morning, I get up at 3 in the morning, and I work four extra hours from 3 in the morning or 4 in the 3 in the morning till 7 in the morning. I've worked four hours extra a day for 40 years. I've had 20 extra years of working. That's why I'm so smart and so successful. And he, this young man over there, said, you should subtract all the time you spend sitting on the toilet. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. I don't tell any stories that aren't true. So, so... I think you made him red. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I, so I, I, I wish that I had figured that balance thing out better. I mean, I've admired what you do, and, and I know you do also a fair amount of that. It's hard to be balanced when you're out of your mind about getting something done. Balance is tough. So I don't think I did a particularly good job of that. Nick, I have a gift for you. Uh, something, something I started doing, uh, I don't know, six or seven years ago that I wish I'd started doing 20 years ago, 30 years ago. Uh, and I'm doing it this weekend. Uh, every weekend, my dad and I, just the two of us, go somewhere, wherever he wants to go. Um, we leave on Friday. We come back on Sunday. Uh, we always meet each other. And we just spend... Uh, really two full days just fucking around. My dad loves chocolate ice cream. I love chocolate. My dad loves chocolate ice cream. And my mother suppresses that love. She, she uh, when I was growing up, does anybody know what ice milk is? Anybody here grew up in Texas? Ice milk is like, like the worst, right? Isn't it awful? Uh, it's like, you know when you have bad ice cream where it's uh, uh, crystallized on top of it? That's better <laughs> than ice milk. So my dad and I, we, we go somewhere for breakfast. We have breakfast, and we have chocolate ice cream for dessert. And then we go for lunch, and we have chocolate ice cream for dessert. <laughs> Sometimes we have chocolate ice cream in the afternoon as a snack. And then for dinner, we go have dinner, we have chocolate ice cream. And one time, we were in, my, we were in South Beach one year, Miami Beach. And, um, and we usually stay in the same room together, which sometimes in certain places, Miami Beach is one of those places where it got some funny looks. Um, <laughs> Uh, but I said to him at the end of the day, I said, that was a great day. I had such a wonderful time with you. What do you want to do tomorrow? We'd been to a deli, and we had chocolate ice cream three or four times. We saw a movie. He said, I want to do exactly the same thing tomorrow, except a different movie. <laughs> but that's my gift to you. Don't wait. Uh, let's do some questions. Jess is in the back. She's got a microphone. The first question goes to a student, please. Coming up front. Thanks. 
I was just wondering if you could talk about what it took to go from being successful in academia and as a researcher to being a successful business person. You know, I think a lot of us are business students, a lot of us are engineers, so uh, what's that transition like? Yeah, I, I mean, I mean, Brad, Brad asked kind of the same question a, a while ago, kind of. I don't think they're different. I mean, I, 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 I'm sorry, I don't. I mean, running a lab is like running a small business. Running a department is a small business. And, and in the end, you're trying to figure out where you're headed in any of them and how to get buy-in from people to push in that direction. And, and I don't think they're different. We, we tend to think they're different in ways that are confusing. I mean, you know, people get confused if you're motivated by making money as opposed to finding things out for the good of knowledge or something like that. But I think the actual work you do every day is very much more similar than different. So I don't think the transition, it didn't feel like a transition to me. The reason that I left what I did, left the university when I did, was I realized that the scale, this was to do Nexage and Nexstar, the scale of the work was different than what you could do in a university. It was not that I wanted to run a company or that I didn't want to be in the university. I was the chairman of a nice department with friends. So it didn't feel different except the work demanded it and it didn't feel like a big transition. It just didn't and it still doesn't. And in fact, we just had that again that across the street for those of you who are choosing what to do, the first thing you have to do is figure out who you are and where you want to do it, not do I want to run a company or do I want to be an academic scientist. That's the wrong question. The right question is what do I want to do and what's the environment in which I can do it, I think. I mean, it's a different way to come at it, I think. So I don't think it's that different. It didn't feel different to me, which may be the reason that I, we now have a grown-up CEO because because I'm really not very good at, you know, at that part of it, of being a grown-up. Let's open up for questions. Others? Straight back. Um, I, I had the opportunity to start a mission-based uh, corporation, and I really felt good about it and good about waking up and doing what I was doing, but getting investors and people to buy into a mission-driven business um, wasn't easy. In fact, I, I'm thinking about writing a book on saying that it's impossible. Um, so if you could comment to, I mean, I think all of us that start entrepreneurial endeavors, or, or many of us, see uh, something that needs to be changed in the world and, and build a company to, to, to make that change. But how do you get people and even in the very nature of corporate finance, in the position to, to buy into that, um, to, to make the investment that's required to, to grow to scale. And the second question I have is, is on the, the B Corp, which is coming to Colorado in the next, um, I don't know, month or so. Um, if, if that it could really change the, the philosophy or, or outlook on, on from an investment standpoint, and maybe Brad could answer this also. I, I, I think, you know, so those are related questions, I guess, and, and um, I, I, I'm not going to like this exactly. I think that um, getting lucky in high school and getting investor money is the same. That is, you ask a lot of people. I'll, I'll weigh in on the B Corp answer. I think, we can just, I, think, I, think, I think that says it all. I think there's another blog post there. Um, uh, I blogged today about one of my favorite Wire episodes. For those of you that watch The Wire, you can probably guess which one it is. Uh, I'll give you a hint. It's in season one. Um, the, uh, uh, the B Corp thing, uh, which, by the way, in Colorado, there's a number of companies that are B Corps. Um, and so, you know, the definition of B Corp versus Beneficial Corp and the dynamics between them are a little bit nuanced. But Rally Software, um, you know, which went public last year is, is uh, uh, a B Corp, but not a Beneficial Corp. Um, I, I don't think that investors 
uh, broadly will uh, be sort of changed views, changed philosophy, changed dynamics around this. Um, I think what you're seeing is you're seeing a lot more discussion, especially at the early stages of investing, seed and angel type investing around impact investing. And, and I would put the B Corp and Beneficial Corp dynamic in that discussion, which is there's a set of people as investors who are looking for specific types of companies. You know, when I was, uh, before I became a venture capitalist, it was double bottom line. After I became a venture capitalist, it was triple bottom line. So this arc of, of trying to do good in your business in addition to just being profitable and, or financially successful is not a new construct. Um, I do think the impact of it being more front and center is, again, people who have had some success and had some wealth and want to put their money back into for-profit ventures versus just nonprofit or their own companies. That gives them an avenue to focus in a different way than just pure investing in people or investing in things they know. Um, the last thing I'd say there is Colorado, and, and Colorado broadly, Boulder in particular, but Colorado broadly has always had a pretty wide range of types of companies. And if you look at you know, the natural foods industry, um, you look at many of the, the sort of energy type things that have been built in and around this region you know, in the last 15 or 20 years, you go into the life sciences universe, there's an awful lot of entrepreneurs who are very, I would say almost obsessed about the problem they're solving and the impact of that problem on the world. And in some ways, whether that's a B Corp or that's the entrepreneur's tenor, as an investor, I would encourage people to pay attention to the entrepreneur's tenor because sometimes the broader impact isn't as obvious uh, until after the thing is successful. And I'll use Twitter as a, as a random example of that. People can make fun of Twitter all they want, but you know there has been regime change largely as a result of Twitter. Um, and you know, there was a whole bunch of other things that happened, but the stimulus of that came from this thing that was pretty widely derided when it was started and was certainly something that was hard for people to view as, you know, the CEO de Costello now refers to as, you know, the world's town hall. Right? So it, it's, a, it's easy in, in hindsight. It's very hard in the moment. And I, I think I just encourage everybody to keep their minds stretched. Um, hi, my question is very uh, short. I'm not sure if it's very easy. Um, what is your favorite book? <laughs> He's got 300 to recommend. <laughs> I like that list. So, uh, yeah. so I, I tend to like the books I'm reading now more than the ones I read a long time ago because, you know, you start reading and you have to decide to finish it. So I, I just read as a pair the Kahneman book about uh, thinking fast and slow, which was really important to me. And I read a book called The Telltale Brain, which was about not thinking of your brain as a black box, but actually thinking about the wiring. And the two books go together. And then I also just almost finished today, more or less, uh, uh, whatever the thing, Bowling Alone, um, which is a sociology book about how much more awful we are now than we used to be uh, at, at the sense of the commons. And I think that's scary to me. So the, I, I tend to not read much fiction anymore. Um, so I'm, 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 I'm kind of trapped in that thing. I also read... Um, both books of Ben Gillette's and love them both. <laughs> For what it's I'll, I'll, I'll add in the book recommendation. We do a thing at some of the events that we do. Um, the introduction, introduce yourself, uh, what you do, and you know, a book, usually in context of the audience. Like if it's an entrepreneurial thing, an entrepreneur book. If it's a science fiction thing, a science fiction book. And th this is uh, in the context of entrepreneurship, given that this is Entrepreneurs Unplugged. Um, and I think it also fits a little bit within the spirit of the conversation. Uh, I think the most impactful book I read as a young entrepreneur was Zen and the Art of Motor Motorcycle Maintenance. Um, how many people here have read it? All right, good. It's half. It's half of you that haven't. Um, and it, it links into this notion of searching for yourself and uh, trying to understand what is meaning 
for the work you're then going to do. And it also shows you how challenging that is and how that can make you crazy. And I think most entrepreneurs that I think are extraordinary that I've worked with um, go through that in their own search for meaning. Um, it's one thing to believe I can get it done, but that's not every day. You have long stretches and sometimes these brief moments of incredible intensity of self-doubt um, or, or long stretches of it didn't work, it didn't work, it didn't work. And you have to understand why you're doing it so just as much as what you're doing it. Uh, so, Larry, I wanted to ask, thank you for linking this genuine discussion about values with uh, real business. Uh, it's something that I don't see too often, and I appreciate it. I'm just curious if you've ever been in a situation where you feel like your business and your values aren't pointing in the same direction and how you handle that. Never. It's not a real answer, of course. I mean, it, it come. I, I think the the places that I feel the dissonance the most is when you know what kinds of people you hope will work with you, and you find yourself on occasion with someone who's just not quite there, and so your human does mine anyway is to help and to coach and to get professional this and that. Because deep down, I'm an optimist not only about work, but you know who people are, and and most of my experience at that uh, has been a failure. Um, uh, I, I suspect most people fail at that most of the time, because it's you're asking a lot. If we're really all hardwired, and you get some reptilian jackass that has to behave in a bad way, toxic or whatever and you think you're going to change that hard wire, you can, you're not. So, you know, you can sort of rationalize how you should make those decisions more quickly, but I never have been able to. So the, the conflict in those situations, I almost always have chosen to try to help somebody rather than to do what I know would be better for the business. Um, but I've never had an ethical problem, a values problem about the certainly soma logic. I mean, soma logic, the, the, in the end, if we succeed, which is early, um, people will have enormous ethical discussions about is it okay for everybody to know your blood proteome and what are we going to do about privacy and what are we going to do about employers and health insurance and all that stuff. Well, those are real conversations, but my belief in the commons is so strong that I'm not so worried about it. You know, people don't want to do what I think would make them live longer lives and healthier lives. And, you know, I, I always show slides about what we offer. We don't offer anything. Nothing's for sale. But, you know, if this is the, the y-axis going this way is the x-axis, so here's the y-axis. It's life quality. And this is the time you have. And the curve is you're kind of okay until you're about 19, and then it just keeps getting kind of dribbling down, and, or maybe it's 40 and dribbling down. So there's a long descent. And my belief about life quality is it ought to be boom, high, and then boom, gone. That's my belief, that we could help make that happen, and you'd have to be an idiot to want to suffer for 52 years or 22 years, why can't you just have that all that area in between, between high quality life and boom? And we've talked as a kind of stupid marketing to try to understand how sharply people want that boom to be. And it turns out it's fascinating. You never get somebody say, you know, I'd like to hang around for 42 years, you know, kind of descending into the grave. Uh, and, and so the arguments turn out to be, do you want a day or a week for suffering? I mean, nobody is sitting around arguing before they're really sick that they want that descent. And I think that's going to happen, that healthcare isn't going to be in the end about 
the hope about um, extending life to be, you know, 120 years old or something. It'll be about higher quality and uh, not soil and green, right? That's not what I have in mind, although it sounds like it, but some kind of moment at which your body gives out and you go away, you know, something like that. So I don't, I don't have many moments where I'm worried about values and business, conflicted values and business. Let's take one more question. I'm going to lob in the last one. Uh, Larry, of all the ideas or beliefs that you have had that have changed, uh, what was the hardest to accept? <laughs> the hardest was that, that, uh, that I realized that my first marriage was going to dissolve and that I was an asshole. That was not, that, that was hard. Is that what you're asking? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I mean, what's so incredible about this, I, I'm sitting here feeling like some sort of boring kind of person because most of the things I thought from, you know, 20 years old till today haven't really changed very much. I don't, that's a sign of a failure of imagination, I would say. Or, or of living true to what you want to live. You know, I, can I say that from now on? I'll blog it. It's, it's better, yes, I like it. <laughs> well, a question I want to put out to, to each of you, um, and it picks up on what you said in terms of the environment or the context in which you want to do your thing. And um, Brad, you've written a lot about the importance of place instead of communities. Um, to both of you, how has place affected you? That is, you both brought strong personalities to Boulder. You both are going to leave a mark on Boulder. But how has Boulder and the place in which you've chosen to do your activities changed you? Uh, I'm happy to, to go first. Uh, I moved here almost uh, 18 years ago, 17 and a half years ago. And, no, 18 and a half years ago. I moved here in 1995. And um, I was looking for the place to live. I grew up in Dallas, Texas. I'm actually going my trip my, with my dad this weekend. We're going to uh, Memphis. I was born in Blyville, Arkansas. So we're going to go to Memphis because you can only spend about 45 minutes in Blyville, apparently. So we're going to drive and then drive back. Um, but I grew up in Dallas, and then I spent 12 years in Boston, which was never home. And my wife Amy and I came out here hoping that this would be home. And uh, uh, we've never looked back. Uh, unambiguously, this is this is home for us. The um, the thing that has become so powerful to me, and I put it in the category of deeply held belief now, is I believe you should pick the place you want to live and build your life around it. Um, if you go back into you know the organizational man and the 1940s and the 19 sort of post World War II 1950s 1960s even 1970s of business, uh, humans and labor, especially professionals, were, were very mobile because the corporation moved you around. You went to where the company told you to go. I, I, IBM, I've been moved, that whole cliche, but that was across professional life. And this notion of, of building a life where you wanted to build it um, was one that existed prior to that. Right? If you think about people in the 1800s, I mean, those crazy entrepreneurs that got in like covered wagons and didn't die and then ended up eventually just saying, that's where we're going to be. And then they picked that place and then they built a life around it. I really, I really think that that's the essence of the next wave of, of the way humans should behave and, or should is the wrong word, how I like to behave. Um, and entrepreneurially, it's very powerful because if you think about the vibrancy and the freshness in any place, much of it comes from new stuff. It comes from new students. It comes from new companies. It comes from new ideas. It comes from people trying new things. And so a vibrant startup community, a vibrant entrepreneurial ecosystem is very healthy in the context of where people want to be and where they want to live. So that, that really has become very intertwined with my own belief system, this notion of, uh, choose where you want to live and then build a life. And, you know, at, at 48, I'm not searching for a want, where I want to live anymore. For those of you that are, you know, in your, in your 20s uh, and haven't chosen the place, I encourage you to think hard about it. Don't be driven by, oh, I have an opportunity here, therefore I must go to this place. But think about what kind of life do you want to have? How do you want to spend 
you know, the rest of it, whether it's a day, a week, or 50 or 75 years. Um, uh, the other comment I'd make on it, I, I traveled continually in, in the same way that Larry gets up at 3 o'clock in the morning. Uh, I traveled Monday through Friday for, you know, the last 25 years, about 75% of the time. I've been very public about this. I broke last year and decided to stop traveling. And so I haven't traveled for business since uh, June. And uh, I may be done. Uh, you know, I, I love being here so much. I love being you know, waking up in the same house as my wife and my dog, you know, being very busy and active and involved in things, but not feeling like I have to drag my sorry declining self uh, uh, all, all over the place unless I want to go to the Greek island or go to my house in Alaska or go to Boston for a week to run a marathon or whatever. And weaving that into your life, it, feels pretty magical, like it changes your view on how you spend your days. And I encourage everybody to stretch that. I, I want to do a coda to that, not a, my own story. So I agree with everything you said 100%. And in the 44 years I've been here, I only looked for a job outside of Boulder once uh, in 1987 when you were uh, four. Right? And uh, my younger daughter was one. And I got offered a job, a dream job, and I fell for it. And I went to Manhattan, and I looked at a job in Columbia, and I left Hope and Nick and M home, and I said, I'll go look, I'll scout it out, and I'll get back to you, darling. This is, you know, this isn't going to end well. And so well, I'm still here. And so they offer me my dream job. I was so, I couldn't believe. And then, and then the head of medicine at Columbia Medical School, when I told him I didn't want them dumping on me because I had a PhD instead of an MD, he said, by the power vested in me in the state of New York, I will give you an MD the day you arrive. I said, ah. Oh. I'd be able to call my mother who was still alive. And my. MD in one day. That's right. That's right. That's right. I'm a doctor. Oh my God. So they then took me across the street and showed me, I'm not making any of this up, a 5,000 square foot apartment looking down on Morningside Park or something with the Hudson Rivers. And it was 5,000 square foot and it had five fireplaces. And they said, Larry, if you take this chairmanship we're going to offer you, we are going to let you and your wife and your kids have this apartment for $700 a month till the day you and your wife are dead. Ah, dying and going to heaven. $700 a month for 5,000 square foot in New York City? Hello. That was unbelievable. And so I called home. And I said, what I just told you, darling, you always say darling when you're asking for the impossible. <laughs> darling, they just offered us a 5,000 square foot apartment with five fireplaces and windows looking at the river, $700 a month until the day we're both dead. What do you think? And she said, quote, you're not going to need such a large apartment. <laughs> I'm going to stay right here. <laughs> Thank you, Larry. That was awesome. Thank you, everybody. Reception. Next door.